My name is Sam Bucknil, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. Modern pop culture bombards us with gender stereotypes, which by now have become truisms. Women are always sensitive, misunderstood, in touch with their emotions, and neglected. Men, on the other hand, are commitment-phobic, confused, narcissistic, hypersexed, and hell-bent on frustrating the opposite number. It was therefore refreshing to watch the four female protagonists of the film What to Expect When You're Expecting reduce these caricatures to smithereens. The women folk in the film are self-centered, dread intimacy and commitment, two of them are workaholics, and all four are rank narcissists. The men in this otherwise middling movie are romantic, in touch with their emotions, committed, and largely selfless. The only exception is the dysfunctional father of one of them, a throwback to the 1960s when men were still machos and sex meant everything. His youthful wife makes up for his shortcomings, though. She is clear-headed, no-nonsense, determined, sharp-witted, and a strict disciplinarian when needed. But this incongruous couple is the only exception to an otherwise coherent message. Men have matured, women should get their act together. The women are the ones who, not so secretly, abhor the thought of what bearing children would do to their bodies and to their lives in this order. The men encourage them to be fruitful and multiply as the ultimate fad in self-fulfillment and self-gratification. Another striking feature of this film is the fact that none of the women, despite being all over the place, feels the need to seek advice. They, f- they live alone. They cope in solitude. Gun are the tip-dispensing mother, the supportive female soulmate, the effeminate or, or gay male friend, the recurring old flame, the motherly colleague or avuncular co-worker. It's every woman for herself now, and they are botching the job, says the film, as thoroughly as men ever did. Simone de Beauvoir said in The Second Sex, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Is this true? In nature, male and female are distinct. She elephants are gregarious. He elephants, solitary. Male zebra finches are loquacious. Females are mute. Female green spoon worms are 200,000 times larger than their male mates. And these striking differences are biological, and yet they lead to differentiation in social roles and skill acquisition. Alan Pease, author of a book titled Why Men Don't Listen and Women Can't Read Muffs, believes that women are spatially challenged compared to men. The British firm, a firm Admiral Insurance, conducted a study of a half million claims. They found that women were almost twice as likely as men to have a collision in a car park, 23% more likely to hit a stationary car, and 15% more likely to reverse into another vehicle. Yet, gender differences are often the outcomes of bad scholarship. Consider Admiral Insurance's data. As Britain's Automobile Association correctly pointed out, women drivers tend to make short journeys around towns and shopping centers. This type of journeys involve frequent parking. Hence, their ubiquity in certain kinds of claims. Regarding women's alleged spatial deficiency in Britain, girls have been outperforming boys in scholastic aptitude tests, including geometry and maths, since 1988. In an opinion piece published by the New York Times on January the 23rd, 2005, Olivia Judson, Judson cited this example. Beliefs that men are intrinsically better at this or that have repeatedly led to discrimination and prejudice, and then they have, they have been proven to be nonsense. Women were thought not to be world-class musicians, but when American symphony orchestras introduced blind auditions in the 1970s, the musician played behind a screen so that his or her gender is invisible to those listening, the number of women offered jobs in professional orchestras increased. Similarly, in science, studies of the ways that grant applications are evaluated have shown that women are more likely to get financing when those reading the applications do not know the sex of the applicant. On the other wing of the divide, 
Anthony Clare, a British psychiatrist and author of On Men, wrote, At the beginning of the 21st century, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that men are in serious trouble. Throughout the world, developed and developing, antisocial behavior is essentially male. Violence, sexual abuse of children, illicit drug use, alcohol misuse, gambling, all are overwhelmingly male activities. The courts and prisons bulge with men. When it comes to aggression, delinquent behavior, risk-taking, and social mayhem, men win gold. Men also mature later, die earlier, are more susceptible to infections and most types of cancer, are more likely to be dyslexic, to suffer from a host of mental health disorders such as attention uh, deficit hyperactivity disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and are more likely to commit suicide. In her book, Stift, The Betrayal of the American Men, Susan Faludi describes a crisis of masculinity following the breakdown of manhood models and work and family structures in the last five decades. In the film Boys Don't Cry, a teenage girl binds her breasts and acts the male in a caricatural relish of stereotypes of virility. Being a man is merely a state of mind, the movie implies. But what does it really men mean to be a male or female? Are gender identity and sexual preferences genetically determined? Can they be reduced to one sex? Or are they amalgams of biological, social and psychological factors in constant interaction? Are, there, are these immutable lifelong features or dynamically evolving frames of self-reference? In rural northern Albania, until recently, in families with no male heir, women could choose to forego sex and childbearing, alter their external appearance, and become men and the patriarchs of their clans, with all the attendant rights and obligations. In the aforementioned New York Times op opinion piece, Olivia Judson opines, many sex differences are not therefore the result of his behave of his having one gene while she has another. Rather, they are attributable to the way particular genes behave when they find themselves in him instead of her. The magnificent difference between male and female greenspoon worms, for, for example, has nothing to do with their having different genes. Each greenspoon worm larva could go either way. Which sex it becomes depends on whether it meets a female during its first three weeks of life or not. If it meets a female, it becomes male and prepares to regurgitate. If it doesn't, it becomes female and settles into a crack on the seafloor. Yet certain traits attributed to one's sex are surely better accounted for by the demands of one's environment, by cultural factors, the process of socialization, gender roles, and what George de Vaux called ethnopsychiatry in Basic Problems of Ethnopsychiatry. He suggested to divide the unconscious into the id, the part that was always instinctual and unconscious, and the ethnic unconscious, repressed material that once had been conscious. The latter is mostly molded by prevailing cultural mores and includes all our defense mechanisms and most of the superego. So how can we tell whether our sexual role is mostly in our blood or in our brains? The scrutiny of borderline cases of human sexuality, notably the transgendered or intersex, can yield clues as to the distribution and relative weights of biological, social, and psychological determinants of gender identity formation. The results of a study conducted by Uwe Hartmann, Hinek Becker, and Claudia Rufa Hesse in 1997, entitled Self and Gender, Narcissistic Pathology, and Personality Factors in Gender Dysphoric Patients. Uh, this study indicates, indicates significant psychological aspects of narcissistic dysregulation in a substantial portion of intersex and transgender patients. Are these psychopathological aspects merely reactions to underlying physiological realities and changes? Could social ostracism and labeling have induced them in the patients? The authors conclude, the cumulative evidence of our study is consistent with the view the gender dysphoria is a disorder of the sense of self, as has been proposed by Beitel in 1985, or Ferflin in 1993. The central problem in our patients is about identity and the self in general, and the transsexual wish 
seems to be an attempt at reassuring and stabilizing the self coherence, which in turn can lead to a further destabilization if the self is already too fragile. In this view, the body is instrumentalized to create a sense of identity, and the splitting symbolizing the hiatus between the rejected body self and other parts of the self is more between good and bad objects than between masculine and feminine. Freud, Kraft Ebbing, and Fleece suggested that we are all bisexual to a certain degree. As early as 1910, Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld argued in Berlin that absolute genders are abstractions, invented extremes. The consensus today is that one sexuality is mostly a psychological construct, which reflects gender, role, orientation. John Meyerovich, a professor of Meyerowitz, a professor of history at Indiana University and the editor of the Journal of American History, observed in her recent published tome, How Sex Changed, a History of Transsexuality in the United States, that every meaning, that the very meaning of masculinity and femininity is in a constant flux. Transgender activists, says Meyerowitz, insist that gender and sexuality represent distinct analytical categories. The New York Times wrote in its review of the book, some male to female transsexuals have sex with men and call themselves homosexual. Some female to male transsexuals have sex with women and call themselves lesbians. Some transsexuals call themselves asexual. So it is all in the mind, you see. This would be taking it too far. A large body of scientific evidence points to the gen genetic and biological underpinnings of sexual behavior and preferences. The German science magazine, Geo, reported that the males of the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, switched from heterosexuality to homosexuality as the temperature in the lab was increased from 19 to 30 degrees Celsius. They reverted to chasing females as the temperature was lowered. The brain structures of homosexual sheep are different to those of straight sheep, a study conducted recently by the Oregon Health and Science University and the U.S. Department of Agriculture Sheep Experiment Station in Dubois, Illinois, revealed. Similar differences were found between gay men and straight ones in 1995, in Holland and elsewhere. The preoptic area of the hypothalamus was larger in heterosexual men than in both homosexual men and straight women. According to an article titled When Sexual Development Goes Awry by Susan Miller, published in the September 2000 issue of The World and I, Various medical conditions give rise to sexual ambiguity. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia, CAH, involving excessive androgen production by the adrenal cortex, results in mixed genitalia. A person with a complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, AIS, has a vagina, external female genitalia, and functioning androgen-producing testis, but no uterus and no fallopian tubes. People with a rare 5-alpha reductase deficiency syndrome are born with ambiguous genitalia. They appear at first to be girls. At puberty, such a person develops testicles and his clitoris swells and becomes a penis. Hermaphrodites possess both ovaries and testicles, both in most, in most cases rather underdeveloped. Sometimes the ovaries and testicles are combined into a chimera called ovotestis. Most of these individuals have the chromosomal composition of a woman together with traces of the Y, male chromosome. All hermaphrodites have a sizable penis, though rarely generate sperm. Some hermaphrodites develop breasts during puberty and menstruate. Very few even get pregnant and give birth. Anne Fausto Sterling, a developmental geneticist, professor of medical science at Brown University and author of Sex in the Body, postulated in 1993 a continuum of five sexes to supplant the current dimorphism. Males, merms, male pseudo-hermaphrodites, herms, true hermaphrodites, firms, female pseudo-hermaphrodites, and female. Intersexuality, hermaphrodites, is a natural human state. We are all conceived with the potential to develop into either sex, the embryonic developmental for default is female. A series of triggers during the first weeks of pregnancy places the fetus on the path to maleness. In rare cases, some women have a male genetic makeup, XY chromosome, and vice versa. 
But in the vast majority of cases, one of the sexes is clearly selected. Relics of the stifled sex remain, though. Women have the clitoris as a kind of symbolic penis. Men have breasts, mammary glands, and nipples. The Encyclopedia Britannica describes the formation of ovaries and testes this way. In the young embryo, a pair of gonads develop that are indifferent or neutral, showing no indication whether they are destined to develop into testes or ovaries. There are also two different duct systems, one of which can develop into the female system of oviducts and related apparatus, and the other into the male sperm duct system. As development of the embryo proceeds, either the male or the female reproductive tissue differentiates in the originally neutral gonad of the mammal. Yet sexual preferences, genitalia, and even secondary sex characteristics such as facial and pubic hair are first-order phenomena. Can genetics and biology account for male and female behavior patterns and social interactions? Can they account for what we call gender identity? Can the multi-tiered complexity and richness of human masculinity and femininity arise from simpler, deterministic building blocks? Sociology, sociobiologists would have us think so. For instance, the fact that we are mammals is astonishingly often overlooked. Most mammalian families are composed of mother and offspring. Males are peripatetic absentees. Arguably, high rates of divorce and birth out of wedlock, coupled with rising promiscuity, merely reinstate this natural default mode, observes Lionel Tiger, professor of anthropology, at Rogers University in New Jersey. That three quarters of all divorces are initiated by women tends to support this view. Furthermore, gender identity is determined during gestation, claim some scholars. Milton Diamond of the University of Hawaii and Dr. Keith Zygmuntson, practicing psychiatrist, studied the much celebrated John Joan case. An accidentally castrated normal male was surgically modified to look female and raised as a girl but to no avail, he reverted to being a male at puberty. His gender identity seems to have been inborn, assuming he was not subjected to conflicting cues from his human environment. The case is extensively described in John Col uh, Colapinto's tome as nature made him, the boy who was raised as a girl. Health Scout News cited a study published in the November 2002 issue of Child Development, and in this study, the researchers from City University of London found that the level of maternal testosterone during pregnancy affects the behavior of male natal girls and renders it more masculine. High testosterone girls enjoy activity, activities typically considered male behavior, like playing with trucks or guns. Boys' behavior remains unaltered in such mothers, the study claims. Yet other scholars, like John Money, insist that newborns are a blank slate as far as gender identity is concerned. This is also the prevailing view. Gender and sex role identities, we are taught, are fully formed in a process of socialization, which ends by the third year of life. The Encyclopedia Britannica sums it up this way. Like an individual's concept of his or her, or her sex role, gender identity develops by means of parental example social reinforcement, and language. Parents teach sex-appropriate behavior to their children from an early age. And this behavior is reinforced as the child grows older and enters a wider social world. As the child acquires language, he also learns very early the distinction between he and she, and understands which pertains to him or her self. So which is it? Nature or nurture? There is no disputing the fact that our sexual physiology, and in all probability our sexual preferences, are determined in the womb. Men and women are different, physiologically, and as a result also psychologically. Society, through its agents, foremost amongst which are family, peers, and teachers, represses or encourages these genetic propensities. It does so by propagating gender roles, gender-specific lists of alleged traits, permissible behavior patterns, perceptive morals norms. Our gender identity or sexual is shorthand for the way we make use of our natural genotypic phenotypic endowments in conformity with social cultural gender roles. Inevitably, 
As the composition and bias of these lists change over time, so does the meaning of being male or female. Gender roles are constantly redefined by tectonic shifts in the definition and functioning of basic social units, such as the nuclear family and the workplace. The cross-fertilization of gender-related cultural means renders masculinity and femininity very fluid concepts indeed. <clears throat> Consider what masculinity and femininity meant in the 1950s and what it means now. One's sex equals one's bodily equipment, an objective, finite, and usually immutable inventory. But our endowments can be put to many uses in different cognitive and affective contexts, and subject to varying exegetic frameworks. As opposed to sex, gender is therefore a socio-cultural narrative by large. Both heterosexual and homosexual men ejaculate. Both straight and lesbian women climax. What distinguishes them from each other are subjective introjects of social-cultural conventions, not objective immutable facts. In the New Gender Wars, published in the November-December 2000 issue of Psychology Today, Sarah Bluestein sums up the biosocial model proposed by Mice Igli, professor of psychology at Northwestern University, and a former student of his, Wendy Wood, now a professor at Texas A&M University. She says, like the evolutionary psychologists Ed, Ed, Igli and Wood, reject social constructionist notions that all gender differences are created by culture. But to the question of where they come from, they answer differently. Not our genes, but our roles in society. This narrative focuses on how societies respond to the basic biological differences, men's strengths and women's reproductive capabilities, and how these societies encourage men and women to follow, to follow certain patterns. If you are spending a lot of time nursing your kid, explains Wood, then you don't have the opportunity to devote large amounts of time to developing specialized skills and engaging tasks outside of home. And, adds Igli, if women are charged with caring for infants, what happens is that women are more nurturing. Societies have to make the adult system work, so socialization of girls is arranged to give them experience in nurturing. According to this interpretation, as the environment changes, so will the range and texture of gender differences. At a time in Western countries when female reproduction is extremely low, nursing is totally optional, childcare alternatives are many, and mechanization lessens the importance of male size and strength. Women are no longer restricted as much by their smaller size and childbearing. That means, argue Eagley and Wood, that role structures for men and women will change and not surprisingly, the way we socialize people in these new roles will also change. Indeed, says Wood, sex differences seem to be reduced in societies where men and women have similar status. If you are looking to live in a more gender-neutral environment, she adds, try Scandinavia. <laughs>